I come to this sermon this morning from the Gospel of Luke, carrying with me this past week powerful memories of things that happened in my life at, in earlier years. One experience was as I sat, and there will be some of you here who will know who I'm referencing, in systematics theology studying with Douglas Crichton, studying liberation theology, more importantly, spending time with Gustave Gutierrez and reflecting on that, and myself and uh, another student by the name of Carolyn Hudson, who some of you will know, had made a decision as we were studying at that time. It's a good thing my wife is not here this morning, by the way. She's on her way to Toronto. Um, we, Carolyn and I, had both decided after a few weeks that we needed probably to consider packing up and leaving and going to a third world country. A wise man by the name of Douglas Crichton reminded us both that we were married, that we had children, and that might not be such a good idea because it's important to live in that context and try and do what you can do where you find yourself at that time. Second point that informed me this morning was a memory I have of being at conference on the West Coast when I was out on the BC coast when all hell was breaking loose with regards to our First Nations people and the abuses that they had experienced. The whole story we know on some levels. And at conference that year, a motion was moved on the floor of conference saying that we had so many properties in the United Church of Canada that we should probably sell most of them and take the money that was earned from those buildings and hand it over to our First Nations people. I seconded that motion because I believed in it. It was defeated. I can tell you that there were a lot of trustees in the church at that conference who stood up and said, you can't do this. You can't take our buildings away from us. But it was narrowly defeated. Some people say to me, who are outside the church, friends of mine and acquaintances, Barry, how do you do it? What they're referencing is, how do I do this, being in ministry in a church? And I say to them, I do it because I am wrapped in the gospel. That's what helps me to do this. I wonder how the Spirit might speak to us today. One of the dangers of being in church as often as I am is that it all starts on a number of different levels to make sense. I speak of the Christian faith so casually and effortlessly that I begin to think, fine thing, this Christianity, it makes good sense. And then I find myself believing all sorts of things in church that I wouldn't let anyone put over me out, over, out in the real world. That which people would choke on in everyday speech, they will swallow if it's in a sermon. That's a blessing for those of us who get paid to preach Christ crucified. And so one day, Kierkegaard could say, Christianity has taken a giant stride into the absurd. And again, he said, remove from Christianity its ability to shock, and it's altogether destroyed. It then becomes a tiny, superficial thing, capable neither of inflicting deep wounds nor of healing them. End of quote. <clears throat> 
Now, if you've been to New York City, you will know what I'm talking about if you've been to this place. A perceptive visitor to this place, the Rockefeller Center in New York City, is surely reminded of the impact of the greatest sermon ever preached, his head on the world. On the first floor of the building, one finds an extensive series of murals depicting man's technological progress in the mastery of nature. Huge, muscular, and tawny, he pries with the labor, hammers with the mallet on a chisel, and turns the great wheel of industry and commerce. And amid these many representations of mankind's glorious achievements stands one mural, which at first glance seems out of place. It's a representation of Christ's teaching on the mount. A heroic figure in white with his hands outstretched blessing. He addresses a multitude of people of every race, class, condition, the poor, the sick, the maimed, the rich who are standing or sitting on the slopes at the foot of the mountain. Some are listening intently, others are conversing with their companions or looking away in other directions, paying no attention at all. Alongside the mural is this legend. Man's ultimate destiny depends not on whether he can learn new lessons or makes new discoveries and conquests, but on his acceptance of the lesson taught to him close on to 2,000 years ago. I find that an arresting statement. It's because I find the sermon on the plain, not on the mount, on the plain that we heard this morning, perhaps the most arresting part of the entire New Testament. The Sermon on the Plain is the most familiar collected sayings from Jesus and is recorded for us. In many ways, it is the Magna Carta of the Christian faith. However, many question whether we have the courage today to follow the teachings of this sermon. So I ask, if we don't begin there, where else do we start? What does it take? What does it mean to take this Jesus literally at his insistence that true discipleship begins with these teachings? So let's look at it. He began, in some ways, by choosing his disciples. He'd summoned them, Peter and Andrew and James and John. They promptly obeyed, and we know the story. They left their nets, their boats, even their father, and they follow this guy named Jesus. They were practical men, called from a practical process of making a living, now set about on this strange an unchartered mission in life. Follow me, he said, and follow him they did. Never one to demand blind faith, Jesus took them apart and he began to teach them the meaning of discipleship. He begins with what we have come to know as the Sermon on the Mount, not on the plain. They must have been thunderstruck as its austere demands, even as you and I are today. The sermon begins with a series of revolutionary statements, which we know as the Beatitudes, goals or ideals for one who would fulfill the requirements of the citizenship of the kingdom of God. Each Beatitude is a challenge. They take the accepted standards of that day and ours and flip them upside down. And then 
the teacher launches into a careful extension of the law from deed to motive. Murder is evil, as the law says, but so also are the anger and the hate which lead to it. Adultery is evil, but so also is the lustful spirit which causes it. Love of neighbor is good, but to love one's enemy is better. And then Jesus warns them of the perils they will face. Enter the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy, that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow, and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who will find it will be few. He gives them the test of good people. You will know them by their fruits. He urges them to be on guard against the constant temptations of Christian lip service. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but those who do the will of the Creator. These teachings are the guides for our daily lives. The witness of the disciples would be the choices they made and the life they lived in faithfulness to these very teachings. The word itself, beatitude, comes from the Latin word beatitudo. That's lousy Latin, by the way, which means blessed or happy or fortunate. Daily, you and I find ourselves face to face with eternal choices in life, and these choices begin in, adult, in childhood and never really end until our life ends. So do we choose the easy way, the pleasure and the profit for the moment in our life? Are we willing to look ahead and sacrifice momentary gain for the greater good? The challenge of the beatitude is, will you be happy in the world's way or in Christ's way? Jesus is saying, if you set your heart and spend your energies to obtain the things of the world's values, you will get them, but that's all you will ever get. So Jesus then goes on to propose the inauguration of a new age, of a new reign of the Holy One, and suddenly the disciples are startled, and if not bewildered, as Jesus began his teaching. These teachings, you see, cut across the ethic of their day. Translation read in today's lesson could have the word happy instead of blessed. To do so gives the Beatitudes an entirely whole new meaning, yet raises some very troubling questions. Happy are the poor? Happy are the sad? Happy are the humble? Happy are those who hunger and thirst? Happy are the merciful? Happy are the persecuted? How can that be? Happiness has to do with being rich and famous. Happiness means being well fed and feeling good. Happiness is getting your own way. Happiness is playing it safe and compromising. We all want to be happy. So much so that many of the philosophers over the centuries have held that happiness is the summum bonum, that is, the highest good in life. Even our culture today tells us that we are just one purchase away from true happiness in our daily lives. We crave happiness. We demand it as our right. We pursue it with all of our energy. And most of us may not admit that this is so, but is there any goal in life which we desire to reach unless it does not bring happiness and contentment and inner peace? 
Where is happiness in poverty? How does one ever find happiness in sorrow and grief? How can a person who suffers or who is persecuted find happiness? I think the Beatitudes are not so much a recipe for happiness or blessedness as they are a description of the Christian life. In his book, The Power of One, James Merrill suggests that the Beatitudes may be more instructive for us when they are inverted and read backwards. By so doing, the Beatitudes are then given an entirely different meaning, a new meaning. Here's what he offers. The way to heaven is through poverty. The way to consolation is through genuine sorrow. The way to earthly possessions is through a gentle spirit that is neither stingy nor possessive. The way to satisfaction is through a hungering and a thirsting for justice. The way to mercy is through mercy. The way to God is through the unobstructed, the open and pure heart. The way to a full relationship with our Creator is through the active practice of peace. The way to God's realm or kingdom is through the struggle for right that leads through conflict, pain, and even death itself. For we take the Beatitudes from this perspective, they can then become something other than a recipe for a reward. They are instead more like a roadmap for our daily lives. They tell us not so much how we might arrive at our destination, wherever that might be, but rather present us with a commanding view of the landscape whereupon our lives are lived. Perhaps I find the biggest surprise in this sermon is that the Holy One's favor seems to be granted to those whom our society regards as the ones who are left out or left behind. Namely the poor, the meek, the mourners, the merciful, those who hunger for justice, the peacemakers, and those who are mistreated in the cause for justice. Perhaps the real question raised by the Beatitudes is, how do we secure happiness and how is it retained? The world offers a thousand formulas, but the Beatitudes we have, Jesus' answer to the question is his guide for true abiding happiness. Ponder Jesus' words, and it becomes increasingly plain that in Jesus' estimation, true happiness depends more on the inner person than on the outward circumstance. Happiness, we are inclined to think, depends upon the possession of materials, material goods, like a new car, a better house, a larger income, or the means to satisfy all of our desires in life. And no doubt these things could bring us joy, at least for a while. But the Creator, I believe, wants us to enjoy the fruits of creation, recognizing, though, that these things do not guarantee happiness. The Beatitudes need, I think, a new emphasis in a day when the cult of happiness in our world has displaced the divine gospel of happiness. This saving gospel teaches that by forgetting self, ultimately we will find out who we are. And by giving, we receive. The kingdom of self, the kingdom of the creator, we find what that little company of disciples assembled on the lower plains and in the story of Matthew up on the mount to hear Jesus outline in the greatest sermon that was ever preached the meaning, the true meaning 
of the kingdom. You will find, as millions of others have, good reason then to share your faith with people who are not here today. The gospel for this week reinforces Paul's ironic contrast between the wisdom of the world and the foolishness of our Creator. When you hear the gospel not with Sunday morning ears, but with Monday morning ears, it can sound foolish indeed, tragically foolish or comically foolish, depending on one's point of view. And so I ask, is the world more like Sunday morning or Monday morning? The first Christians of the day were thought to be drunk with new wine, and Festus thought Paul's defense of the faith merited a court-ordered psychiatric examination. But by the world's standards of what works, and who is the greatest, and what is practical, practical in life, I'll still say the Christian faith because it does look foolish indeed. Maybe, maybe my prayer would be this week, I hope we can wrap ourselves every day of our lives in the gospel as we live and breathe in this world. May it be so for you and may it be so for me.